I think they do need more hope, and I think they need, you know, a pathway. You know, to, to what does it? You know, what can they do as an individual? That's the challenging thing, isn't it? You know, because we're talking about systems change. Yeah. So, you know, if we t if we talk about you know our water, s the situation with with sewage at the moment and, and 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 the water, that's a systems change problem, isn't it? So, who owns the system? Nobody actually owns the system, do they? We've got I think it's 11 different water companies and then you know five additional companies and. You know, it's very fragmented. Um, it's, there's a lot of foreign ownership that's happening as well in, 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 in terms of those water companies and how it's privatized. I mean, there's a, you know, again, Paul Whitehouse, BBC, yeah. Our Troubled Rivers. If you haven't seen it, it's a brilliant documentary explaining the system and the problem that we're, that we're facing. So I do sometimes think, you know, sitting in the BBC, we push a lot onto the individual. Yeah. We do make it the individual's problem, right? It's your problem if you're buying plastic. Because sometimes when you do go into, say, the supermarket, you are faced with the problem, aren't you? The cucumber's already wrapped in plastic. So, you know, and, you know, you have to make an active choice not to buy that, that cucumber. The supply chains are already there. It's a problem. And, and with, the, but with the Wild Arts, and you're, you're specifically partnering with, with different NGOs to, 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 to elicit action from, from the viewer. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Because it's really important yeah. that there is not only an expose on what's happening and yeah. the, the wildlife around us and how we can protect it, but how we take action. And, and how has the BBC managed to do that and yeah. collaborated with different NGOs to achieve Yeah, that? we took a slightly different approach, perhaps a you know, slightly braver approach, I guess, with, with Wild Isles, five-part series, um, is that we actively partnered you know, with WWF, RSPB, and the National Trust. Um, and we had an... Um, a journey that you could go on. You could watch the program, you know, get the facts if you like, and the knowledge, and understand, um, you know, the state of nature here in the UK. And then there was an onward journey called Save Our Wild Isles um, that enabled you to sort of access RSBB, WWF National Trust, actually join community activities. You go to parks, get engaged, um, and actually start feeling like you're part of the solution rather than just hearing the problem being restated all the time, which which is can be quite demotivating and also quite depressing. Um, so we're trying to take people on that onward journey. And that was the first time those three major charities apparently had collectively come together. And they said by doing that, that actually activated more energy. It's like the sum is greater than the parts. That activated more action as a result of coming together rather than being seen as three separate charities doing their own thing. And around that, I mean, I, I did have a slide. It, it basically talks to the BBC created the inciting moment, and that's what we call it. But we also connected it with all our other programming as well. So it wasn't just in isolation. So we had it even mentioned on The One Show, for example, or in Country File. You know, we had loads going on on radio and BBC Sounds, sort of drawing it together. So that when pe our audiences, you're listening to the radio, or you're catching something on the television at a different time, you know, there's this connectivity that we're all talking about nature, and we're all talking about our, our, our wild isles, you know, our great British isles. Um, and, and as I said, it was the first time we had this sort of baton, if you like, that was formerly to our partnerships to say, look, this is a huge opportunity to have an onward journey with our audiences and to bring them into the solution of what we can do about this. Um, and what we're trying to do now is actually look at the impact of that and actually measure it. So we did actually do some impact measurement. We've done some impact measurements quite sophisticated using something called regression analysis, which basically clever maths to determine as a result of watching something, you know, can we capture the behavioral change that has happened? We know about the informing and educating and we can track that through surveys, but can we actually capture the change? Um, and it's examples like, you know, visiting, going for a walk, visiting a natural space, going to a park, taking the kids to the park, changing your diet, potentially not flying as much. We capture some of these things and we can track it. As a result of watching our program, we can see that the behavior does change. I do think there's even more stickiness with some of the educational parts of it as well, perhaps even stickier than the behavioral change that we see from our program. So we have a program, we have a moment, we have a series, and then how long does that behavioral change last for? That's what we're grappling with at the moment. But we need a longitudinal study with other broadcasts potentially as well to really understand that and to, like your point about continuing the conversation. You know, where are we with plastics now? How do we do that? Um, uh, and on that point, and it's great that you're tracking that impact. Impact's so important. It's no point in us just talking about the issues and exposing them, but we need to 
drive change and drive action. And that's you know, what we're seeing at the moment um, in a, a very new way. And it would be remiss for us not to, um, to talk about water quality again. Um, I'm very sad and I apologize um, that Fergal is not here with us today. I saw him up in a Labour Party conference. He was doing the rounds, talking to everyone and anyone about the sewage scandal that you'll all be familiar with. Um, it's become a metaphor um, for some of the decline in, in our environment more widely and perhaps in other parts of our society, which is very, um, you know, very interesting. It's good to see at the top of the agenda. Of course, many people, um, myself included, have worked on water quality issues for many years, but it's been the last 18 to sort of 24 months that it's really become a hot public issue again. And I wonder when the broadcasters decide on that, because four or five years ago when the issues were the same, it had a modicum of interest from the, 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 the big media and brands, but now everyone wants a piece of it. It's something the public's really engaged with. How do the media decide on that? When's that sort of inflection point, when it becomes the zeitgeist, becomes the new thing? It was plastics five years ago, it's sewage now, it may be something else in another few years. Yeah, and that's a great question. I mean, it's essentially the job of the commissioner you know, to understand, you know, what societal norms are, what people want to hear about, learn about those topics, and then they have a budget, and then they can affect that budget. And then, as a result of that, we had our Troubled Waters, which was a documentary piece um, that was commissioned. And um, that's how the system kind of works. It's a commissioning process. Um, and what we try and do in, in my team is to try and train those commissioners on this is... This is, the, this is the science, this is the evidence. I mean, you are tackling, you know, a lot of people want to watch Succession, for example. Do you know what I mean? They want to watch other things or entertainment. Um, some of these topics, I would have, you know, environmental content, if I ruled the BBC, streaming 24-7, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's um, you know, I'm not at liberty to do that. So, um, obviously, we have to balance this, don't they? We have to balance our programming mm -hmm. with what our audiences want. And we often debate about, are we a mirror of society, or are we a mover of society? And I think we're both, aren't we? We, you know, we, ha we have a brain print. Um, obviously, we, we do want to mirror society and, and what people want to, to, to see and hear. Um, but we also, potentially on some issues, need to move society and educate people and inform people. And that is our role. That's clearly our role. Inform, educate, and entertain is in our charter and our purpose at the BBC. So. Uh, and just coming on to that in terms of informing, we've been informing for a long time on, um, on the climate crisis. Um, yeah. it's, um, it's in the public narrative all the time. We've got people taking to the streets in record numbers, um, you know, constant news cycle of the sort of big, you know, the, the big impacts around the world, the flooding, the fires, the tragedy that's happening around the world. You know, is this coverage driving the right level of action? A, a, political level too. The, the science is unequivocal, yeah. um, you know, the, 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 the ministers are there in place, but are they taking the action fast enough? And what's the responsibility of the BBC and other media outlets to actually force the point and demand more of our politicians to act at the pace of, yeah. of, 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 of the urgency um, of the, the crisis we find ourselves in? Yeah, I mean, look, um, we do have a lot of action on this topic. Mm. You know, we have Justin Rowlett and he, you know, we have, if you watch our news cycles, and I, I think I said up front, we have this journalism um, climate commitment that we've made, we're the first to do that. Uh, we have looked at all of our environmental output and we have the, the largest amount of content on this topic. Um, is it driving the urgency? No. I think that's clear, sadly. We are competing with, uh, obviously, with other issues. We've got two wars at the moment that we're tackling with. Um, one's just obviously kicked off in, um, in the Middle East, the Ukraine war. We've got the, the cost of living crisis. You know, so we're constantly competing, aren't we, with these other agendas, what's, what's important mm -hmm. to people. And I think there is a risk of sort of climate fatigue. In the last three months, um, the science is telling us that the mean average temperatures um, are at 1.75 above pre-industrialized temperatures. Now, that may be a, an excursion, as they call it, a spike, but that's pretty scary. Again, it's the, you know, the numbers don't seem to be creating the change yeah. that we're anticipating. So um, I think we just have to keep our content true, talk evidence-based, which we do. Um, but well, look, yeah. 
Thank you for what you're doing. I want to, it's, it's big issues, big systemic changes we need, and often pretty scary. As you say, um, you know, the, the, the facts are daunting. Uh, we live in challenging times. But I want to end, because I'm conscious of time, on, on hope. What, yes. what gives you hope? What, what gives you hope for the future? What would you like to see in the coming years on this environmental agenda? Well, I think that Blue Planet clip um, demonstrates you know, the power of collective action when you do come. I think people feel better. We always feel better, don't we, when we're all connected and we're talking about it. Um, and yeah, that we're all kind of, in effect, sort of galvanized behind this. And I think the human race is quite resilient. I think you know, we will see a response to this in the future. You know, how quickly that response will be and whether it, Al Gore's statement at the moment, we're going to fix this, we've got this. Um, but it's whether we do that, that in time. I think that's my concern. But I think all of us play a role to play have a role to play, particularly if you're at this conference, in, in driving that kind of um, public discourse and getting the conversation going, not just in our organizations, but at home, in our schools, and, and with our family and friends. So that gives me hope that it can happen. Amazing. Well, thank you very much, Danielle. Yeah. Big round of applause for Danielle thank and you. the BBC. Thank you.